Love you, O oh Lord, my strength. To you, my soul clings at all times. Trust in you with all my. Good morning, River Life family. Glad you're setting apart this time and keeping it holy. If you're joining us for the very first time, welcome to River Life. It's our prayer that you will encounter the unconditional love of God in our time together. And we hope that we'll be able to meet you in person soon. Sunday is the Lord's Day, and it is proper to set aside our normal work routines and gather with God's people for worship and for encouragement. The scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified or washed in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. We are the church, the called out ones. Scripture reminds us that we are where we are because of God's grace in our lives, evident in the church which God places us in and calls us to. We are called together into this family through, through one Saviour, under one God, and powered by one Spirit. We are called together. We are not a collection of individuals. Together is how we are called to do what we are called to do. The Old Testament equivalent described Israel as the people summoned into the presence of God to hear Him and to respond in obedience. When God called His people, He called them into a covenant community. We are here because our calling is not preference. As one people, we learn from the early church that worship is not just what we do, it's who we are. Let us arise to sing to address God directly. As we move into a time of worship, I encourage you to fix your eyes on Jesus, put away our phones and distractions so that He can have all of us as we minister to Him. Good morning, church. Even as we come to God's presence, shall we just uh, bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, we honour your presence in this place. 
Got in our bedrooms and in our living rooms, Lord, we give you free reign, Lord. God, we say, Lord, we yearn for your presence today. Your presence is our joy, God, and it's our reward. We come to your presence to offer you praise and offer you worship. Let us 
us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let's make this our prayer. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your love. is our treasure, Lord. Oh, lead us not from your presence, O oh Lord. We choose your presence over everything else, Lord, in our lives. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your presence, God, there is hope and there is love. That's where we want to stay, Lord Jesus. We sing of your love today, God. We sing of your greatness. We sing of your goodness to us.
your presence and just lay ourselves before you to offer you praise to offer you worship to offer you our adoration God Lord we say together as one church you are worthy you are worthy of all every breath of all praise and all worship God we enthrone you we exalt you in this place let your name be enthroned in this church let your name be enthroned, O oh God. So we thank you for this time of worship and we pray um, yeah, that you would bless us even in our homes and everywhere we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Sherman, for leading us in worship. Time with the Lord is so precious. And I trust that this time of worship has encouraged you to behold Christ and remember His faithfulness in your life. Since Friday, I'm sure many of us are excited with phase two of reopening as we emerge from a two month circuit breaker period. Though parts of the economy are reopening, Worship gatherings will still not be permitted to reopen. So our worship services will remain online until further notice. We miss congregational worship as believers and we are hoping that we can gather again soon. Since the pandemic hit as a church, we have been looking into how we can better communicate with River Lifers to help everyone stay updated with church developments. Now, most of you have been getting updates from your cell leaders, but we do want to free our leaders to focus on shepherding and discipleship. At the same time, we also want to help newer worshippers who are not yet in a cell group with timely updates. With these considerations, we are happy to announce that we have just launched our River Life WhatsApp and Telegram channels. Both channels are now available for subscription and both will broadcast the same messages. You only need to subscribe to one channel unless you want to receive from both. 
If you are a subscriber of gov.sg, it works the same way. As a subscriber, you can look forward to receiving links to help you join our weekly services and engage in our weekly church life rhythms. Periodically, you may also receive pastoral addresses, sale advisories and also special announcements. You can subscribe to the channels at this link, rlc.sg slash subscribe. And we look forward to connecting with you on WhatsApp and Telegram. Now, today in this season, let us continue to worship the Lord through our tithes and offerings. There is no worship without sacrifice. And you can give digitally via PayNow or Interbank Transfer. More details can be found on the link shown on this screen. Short prayer for the offering. Lord, we thank you for this time and an opportunity to participate in building your kingdom through our resources. Cause us to be good stewards of our resources and we pray that these gifts that we give can be given to extend your kingdom. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to participate in building your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Today is also a special day. It's Father's Day, a day to honour and celebrate all the fathers amongst us. My dad will turn 87 this year. I was meant to visit my parents um, recently uh, after our two leaders' retreats in May. But because of the pandemic, both retreats were rescheduled and my trip was also rescheduled. I'm a little bit disappointed. I hope to visit my parents once we can travel again. Now, a father is called to represent God to their children. A father is called to give his children a glimpse of our Heavenly Father's love and presence and lead our children to love God. And through this, earthly fathers get a first-hand experience and a heart understanding of the Father heart of God. And of course, dads disciple their children together with mums. Before I pray for fathers in our midst, here's a short video we'd like to share with you. It's a light-hearted video of our children wishing fathers a happy Father's Day. I hope you like the clip. Let's pray for our fathers in our midst. 
Abba Father, we thank you for the heads of households. We thank you, you love us so much that you put us into homes and households and families. We thank you that you put fathers and mothers over our lives and that they can love us and protect us and raise us to love you and to know you and to fear you. So today, Lord, we say a special blessing on all fathers in our midst. And Lord, may your grace and your favour and your mercy be upon their lives as we remember them and celebrate them in our lives. So Lord, thank you for our fathers and we bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. I will now hand the time over to Pastor William who will bring us a special message on Father's Day. William is a friend. He is Pastor Emeritus of Bartley Christian Church. He is also Chairman of the Bartley Family of Churches of whom River Life is part of. He serves in a volunteer capacity in preaching, counselling, prayer and evangelism. He is married to Iris and have, they have two daughters and they have one grandson. Pastor William. Good morning and happy Father's Day. You know, with this lockdown, the world over. Reports have come in to tell us that with this working from home, with families gathered in close confines of the home, there's been increase of family disputes, of stress, even family violence. And so today I thought it is important for us to address this issue of dysfunctional Christian families. And we, it's so important for us as God's people to be able to understand what God is telling His church today. And so I would like to read from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, reading from verse 14. And the Apostle Paul says this, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the lost holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And now to Him, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank You that we are Your children. Thank You for Your love for us. Thank You for giving us life. Thank you for relationships that enrich our lives. And we ask, O oh God, that you speak to us by your Holy Spirit and help us to understand what you are saying to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Family is God's idea. From the very beginning, from the book of Deuteronomy, God tells His people, that we are to teach His laws to our children and our children's children so that they can do well in life and that they can enjoy long life. And in the New Testament, in this portion of God's Word that we have just read, the Apostle Paul talks about this God that he prays to from whom the families in heaven and earth derives his name. He talks about family. And the Apostle Paul is so, so strict in terms of the people of God 
living in accordance to God's biblical injunctions for families. And later on in chapter 5, he writes about the roles and responsibilities of the husband, the wife, the children, and so on. But before that, in this particular chapter, he talks about the inner life. He talks about the importance of focusing on our inner life. And we know that family relationships can give us the greatest joy or the greatest pain. And someone once said, a relationship with your family should be a safe haven, not a battlefield. The world is hard enough already. And if today you find yourself in a dysfunctional family, I would like to encourage you that you will come before God and the focus that I would like to encourage you this morning is to come to God and to tell God, God, here I am. Change me. And it's not about the external circumstances. It's not about the other people within your family. It's really about yourself. The willingness to ask God to change us. And what is the definition of a dysfunctional family? A dysfunctional family is one in which conflict and instability are common and constant. The traits of a dysfunctional family's family are poor communication, addictive behavior, perfectionism, lack of empathy, excessive control, and constant criticism. And there are serious consequences research has shown for prolonged family dysfunction. Its impact on children, developmental disorders, and security, socially isolated. Its, its impact on spouses, bitterness, joyless, spiritual apathy. And its impact on future generations, a vicious cycle of dysfunction. And the most serious of which is this, neural pathways developed from childhood traumatic experiences help shape how we respond to others and adults often find themselves repeating the same behaviours and patterns throughout their lives. And God being the one who started families, has given us a blueprint of a functioning Christian family. And that blueprint shows Christ as the head of the family. The husband as the spiritual leader of the family. And the wife as someone to be the help made for the husband to comfort, to teach, and to nurture. And children within the biblical structure of the family are to love and to honour their parents. And we all know that. All of us who have been Christians for many years have heard of messages preaching, or preachers telling us about the role of the husband or the father, the role of the wife or the mother, and the role of children. It's not for lack of knowledge. But the dilemma all of us have is this. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Romans 7, 18 to 20. New Living Translation. And how do we get into this cycle, this spiral of dysfunction. There is this mindset ingrained into us which tells us that we are unloved, unwanted, and will never be good enough. This may start in childhood. This mindset makes us strive to earn our acceptance. It makes people feel driven to perform in order to be approved. And this mindset makes people feel they are loved for what they do rather than for whom they are. And 
And this mindset of rejection started from the Garden of Eden. When the first human couple chose to dishonor God's commands, that God expelled or rejected them from the Garden of Eden. And since then, this virus of insecurity, this spirit of rejection has invaded mankind. Every man, woman and children has within their DNA this spirit of rejection that they have to earn acceptance. And if we do not deal with this spirit, this mindset of rejection, it can lead to a wounded spirit and is expressed in Proverbs 18 verse 14. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? And what is the symptom of a wounded spirit? The symptom of a wounded spirit is that you either feel absolutely nothing, like you are dead inside, or you are hypersensitive in that area and can explode at the slightest provocation. And if a wounded spirit is not dealt with, it can soon lead to a defeated spirit. Perhaps a sentiment best expressed by Job. Why then did you bring me out of my mother's womb? Why didn't you let me die at birth? Then I would be spared this miserable existence. And this is really crucial for us to understand. And I'm speaking to you this morning about overcoming family dysfunction from a personal experience because I have been brought up since childhood and teenage years in a highly dysfunctional family and I will share with you towards the end. But it's important for us to understand the importance of dealing with insecurities, dealing with the wounded spirit, and dealing with the defeated spirit that can lead to a runaway spirit. And there's a biblical example I want to show to you of Leah. In Genesis chapter 29, we read of this story of Leah. Leah, as we know, is one of two daughters of Laban. The other, her sister, younger sister, is Rachel. And we know that Rachel is the beautiful, pretty one. Whereas Leah, we read in Genesis 29 verse 17, that she has no sparkle in her eyes. In other words, she doesn't look attractive at all. And when Jacob came into the household of Laban, and he set his eyes on Rachel and wanted to marry Rachel, Laban schemed that she deci he decided to disguise the elder daughter Leah and let Jacob marry her instead. And I was just imagining a possible conversation that Leah, her daughter, may have with her father Laban. When the father came to her with this scheme that I'm going to trick Jacob into marrying you, perhaps... Leah would tell the father, Dad, don't do this. Don't do this to me. You know that Jacob loves Rachel. How can you get me to marry him on the sly? Perhaps the father would have told Leah this. Leah, I'm doing this for your own good. Because if I don't do this, you will never ever be married. No man will ever want you. Imagine the sense of rejection that Leah felt from the father. And so she went along with the scheme. And she got married to Jacob. And they had sexual relationships. In the morning when Jacob woke up, he had the shock of his life to find not Rachel by his bedside, but Leah. And imagine the shock that Jacob felt and the look of disgust in his eyes at Leah. Imagine the rejection that Leah would have felt, not only from her father who rejected her and said that she would never be able to be married, and now by her husband. 
and God saw that Leah was unloved. And God saw the, the, the spirit of rejection, the wounded spirit that was in Leah because of her father and the husband Jacob. And God allowed Leah to conceive and have children. And now Leah sought acceptance through her children, her firstborn. She named him Reuben. Because the word Reuben is seen. And she expressed it in Genesis 29 verse 32. The Lord has noticed my misery and now my husband will love me. She thought that by giving her husband a child, the husband will love her. And sometimes we think this way as well that we must earn our acceptance, but we, that we must work for the acceptance of the people that are important to us. And the second son she had, she named him Simeon. Simeon meaning heard. And she expressed it to say, the Lord heard that I was unloved. Genesis 29 verse 33. The third child she had, she named him Levi. And the word Levi means attach. And she said, surely this time my husband will feel affection for me since I have given him three sons. And so all the three sons that Leah had and the time that she was looking at how God had blessed her, she focused inward about her need for acceptance. But when she had the fourth, fourth child, her shift shifted from inward to upward because she named her fourth son, Judah. And Judah is praised. And he says, now I will praise the Lord. And so God extended His grace towards Leah, the rejected one. Because we know that the Saviour of the world, Jesus, came through the lineage of Leah's fourth son, Judah. And so God extended love and compassion and grace to Leah, the rejected one. How do we overcome dysfunction within our family? And this is where I want to share with you some of the handles that you and I can grab hold of. Number one is an admission of the need for change. We must Admit that we need an inward change. And King David, when he wrote Psalm 51 and verse 6 to verse 7, he recognized that he needs change. He says, Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You give me wisdom in my inner being. And then he says to God, Cleanse me, O God, and I, will sh I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be clean whiter than snow. David came from a dysfunctional family. David had a spirit of rejection. We know that as we read from God's word that David's mentor Saul rejected him, tried to kill him. We read from God's word that even God's people rejected David as king and refused to give him his kingship. And we read from God's word that even his own family, Absalom, his son, schemed to take away the throne from him and sought to kill him. And so David lived through all this rejection. But ultimately, David recognized it is not about Saul. It's not about the people of Israel. It's not about Absalom. It is about him and his inner being. That he needs to change. And until and unless we come before God and say to God, God, here I am, change me. We can never deal with our insecurity that leads to family dysfunction. The second thing we ought to do, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16, which we have read just a moment ago, Pray for your family consistently. Because the Apostle Paul says this. When you read this portion of God's Word, you see, Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles. And he was writing to this church in Ephesus, which he set up. 
And he understood that in order for this church to be able to be the salt and light, that he must pray for them. He must pray consistently and passionately for them that God will strengthen them in their inner being. Because until and unless this church is strengthened, they can never influence the world. And so the Apostle Paul says, I pray that God will strengthen you. And then he says later on, I pray that you being rooted and established in love. And so Paul, with the passion that God gave him, prayed for the family of God consistently and passionately. And if we want to overcome dysfunction within our families, we must pray for every member of our family. The third thing, we must deal with our inner insecurities. Because the Apostle Paul says in verse 16b, he says that you, will, that you may be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. Many of the problems in families arises from the insecurities within. And so if you want to deal with family dysfunction, if you want our Christian homes to be a haven of love, of peace, instead of strife and confusion and conflict, we must be willing to deal with our inner insecurities, with the baggages that we carry over our lives for so many years. And if you need to seek a counsellor to help you to deal with these inner insecurities. And we must draw on Christ's love because Apostle Paul tells us, and he mentions there that you may be able to experience how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. This love is the experiential love of God, of Christ. It is not from knowledge. It is from your experience, your inner being. Draw on Christ's love. If you want to overcome family dysfunction, tell God, God, here I am. Change me from the inside. And then draw on the love of Christ to understand, to grasp how much Christ loves us and how much we ought to love one another, especially our family members. And then he tells them in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, hold on to God's promise. Because Paul, as he talks about all these things that we ought to do to deal with our inner life, he says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We must believe that we have a God who is able. We must believe that we have a God when we come to Him and we say, God, here am I, here I am, change me. When we come to Him praying earnestly and passionately for our family, when we come to Him to ask Him to deal with our inner insecurities, that when we draw on the love of Christ within our hearts, that this God is able to answer our prayers, reject the lie of the evil one. You see, many families, if they have gone through a prolonged period of dysfunction, may believe the lie of the evil one. You will never change. Your family will remain like this forever. There's no way we've tried it before and we always go back to the same issues. Reject the lie of the evil one. Believe that God is able Hold on to the promise of God. There is a God who is the promise keeper. If we come to Him in sincerity, He will respond to us and He will surprise us to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ever think or imagine. And then, never give up. You see, when the Apostle Paul writes to his church, it is important for us to understand that it's a constant pursuit that we must do it consistently and regularly. 
We can't just say, I'll do all this and then we try for a month or so and we give up. There must be that persevering spirit. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, we are told that in due season, we will reap if we don't give up. And so I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you are experiencing family dysfunction and you are at the end of yourself and you're finding yourself drained out in all these conflicts, that you do not give up in just coming to God to ask Him to transform and to help. And so now I would like to just give you a testimony as I wrap up this morning's sharing. A testimony of God's grace in my life. I told you I grew up in a very high octane dysfunctional family. You know, there are very various degrees of dysfunction. Some Christian families, maybe your degree of dysfunction is about a three or a four. Some maybe an eight or nine. My family dysfunction is a degree of nine. You see, there's my father on the screen there. He is a merchant. And my mother is a, was a teenager then. My father had three wives. And he was not a father that fulfilled his responsibility to protect, to provide. And the two wives, the second and the third wives, with us as children, seven of us, live in what I call this kampong house, what I call a house of dysfunction. Constant quarrels and fights and conflict within this home between the, my mother, which is the third wife, and the second wife. And the conflicts were so vicious and, and so regular that I always have this fear within me that one day my mom will be killed. Because they were using scissors and sometimes going to the kitchen to get, get knives and they quarrel and they fight. And so I was feeling from young that insecurity within my spirit. There was just no peace at all. And then my father died at the age of 48 from a heart condition. And when he died, the son, the eldest son of the first wife, George, came to take care of the children of the second and the third wife. And this picture was taken 60 years ago. And this is me, defiant, and living in that environment of constant conflict. I developed a coping mechanism and so I became very mischievous and defiant. And so whenever I commit an offence, I will be punished once, caned once by my own mother. And because we live in the same household as the second mother, I'll be caned twice by the second mother. In those days, there's no double jeopardy. You will be punished for the offence more than once. But I take comfort that I am not the son of King Solomon. 700 wives Otherwise, I'll be known as the boy with many stripes. You know, in this situation, when I grew up to be a teenager, there was this constant thought in my mind, the moment I'm able to get a job and to earn a living, I'm out of this house. I've had enough of it. I have this spirit of rejection. I wasn't accepted in the family. I have this wounded spirit, I have this defeated spirit, and I have this runaway spirit that maybe some young people also experience. I want to run away from home. But you know, running away from home never solve a problem of insecurity. But by God's grace, I was able to go overseas for my studies. And then I came to know Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. And he transformed me completely, took away all my insecurities, healed my wounded spirit, and enabled me to function normally. And I remember, I was praying to God. I said, God, can you give me a loving, gracious, peaceful family? And so, when finally I got married, 
God remembered my prayer. And today, this is my extended family. I have a wonderful wife, Iris, two daughters, two son-in-laws, and Zachary, a two, two years, five months old now. A blessing from God. And the parents named him Zachary. And the meaning of Zachary is God remembers. God remembered my prayer that because I've been suffering all these years up to my early 20s in a dysfunctional family and that I asked God to just enable me to experience the joy of a functioning biblical family and God responded and answered that prayer. And Iris and I pre-lockdown or pre-circuit breaker, we were taking care, the main caregivers for Zachary and I would be sitting in a chair, lunch, I will feed him lunch and after that, I will just put him to bed. I will sit on a chair next to his cot and he will normally take about 10 minutes to sleep and he wants me to stay around until he sleeps. And in that time, I will be praying for my grandson. I would pray that God will strengthen my grandson, Zachary. I pray that God will give him a character that will be empathetic of others. I pray that God will enable Zachary to know Jesus as Lord and Saviour early in his life. And I pray for his development. But if he takes more than 10 minutes to sleep, I will fall asleep first. You see, this is my responsibility. I have experienced the joy of fatherhood and by God's grace, now, the joy of being a grandfather. And I want to just play my role, my role, Iris and I, as grandparents, to build into the lives of the next generation that they will know God and that they will put their trust in God, and that the cycle of dysfunction in my family when I was a child stops. We do not allow the cycle of dysfunction to in affect the future generation. And I thank God that God answered that prayer. And so today I want to encourage you. Some of you may be going through or living in dysfunctional Christian families. And I want to encourage you to trust that God can and will give you the resources to overcome. And that if you admit your need for change in the inner being, and that you would pray passionately, and that you would just come to God and ask God to take away the inner insecurities within you. And that you will hold on, that you will draw on the love of Christ and hold on to God's promise and never give up. That God will transform you and transform your families. And God will bestow on you a crown of beauty instead of ashes the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And this is my prayer for all of you as you continue to draw to God, to ask God to change and to transform. Here I am. Change me. And so I want to give you a few moments now just to pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for your family and make some resolution or make a prayer or commitment to God that you indeed will play your role within the family structure that He has ordained. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. And Lord, I want to pray for fathers within our midst. Lord, you have placed them as the spiritual leader in their homes. And Lord, I pray during these very tumultuous times that you will strengthen our fathers, that you will enable them to experience the love of Christ in their hearts. That you will help them, give them that resolve to want to provide that leadership that is needed within their families. Father, I pray for mothers that they too will be the helpmate for their husbands. That they will continue to nurture they will continue to provide guidance for their children. And Father, we want to pray for our children. I pray, O oh God, to help our children to love, to honor, to obey their parents. And Lord, I pray that you transform our families, that you enable us during these very difficult days to strengthen our family structures, to get our house in order. And Lord, I pray, that you bless us, that you will encourage us, that you will strengthen us. We thank you for hearing our prayers and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor William, for sharing God's Word with us today. We hope that you've been built up and encouraged through this online service. In this season, when we are unable to meet in person, we encourage you to continue meeting in your cell groups virtually. For cell groups gathering right after this service, you can use the discussion guides provided at the link shown on this screen here. Remember to follow us on Facebook, and Instagram to stay updated on important church matters and receive content in the form of testimonies, videos, and resources. Till our next time together online, continue to carry God's presence wherever you are and to review Him wherever you go. Now let me pronounce the benediction. May the grace of our God the love of Jesus and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. darkness you're the dawn that breaks the night lord your truth has set me free from death to life your great love never failing your faithfulness extends to the heavens high above it never
Unto Him be all glory, honor, and praise forever. Now to Him who is able to do all things, above all we can conceive. Unto Him be all glory.
fly Flowing from your glorious throne, oh God You're filling every heart Jesus is moving in Power and love, we welcome you, oh Lord The King of glory is here Set the captives free. Let the blind eyes see. We bring on our knees a greater glory, a greater glory. Flood our church with your power. Touching the bro